you can start brother okay okay welcome everybody to css 413.1 pseudo randomness this is the second offering of this course in our department so before we get actually started on the technical details let's get some administrative work out of the way so uh, this course there's a web, so you would have already ram prasad had sent most of you guys an email with information about the course so if you are not already there do send an email about the acad so the course will be managed via acadly and a web page maintained on my website so most of the information regarding the course will be posted on this website so you will find both links to the these handwritten notes so you don't have to take notes during lecture i will post them immediately at the end of the lecture on this one as well as you'll also the lectures are going to give you can access them both via zoom as well as they are live uh, streamed on youtube it's preferable if you if you have better net, network access it's preferable you join zoom so that i know who is um, uh, sitting in lecture uh, youtube i don't get to know who's doing it but the youtube uh, the things that are streamed on youtube will be preserved so you can go and look it up later on so classes will be tuesday thursday 9:30 to 11 and then what else do we have for all the people who are crediting the course so what's the grading policy of the this one so we're going to have there won't be any exams this is an advanced graduate course we won't have any exams or uh, projects and we might have a, a paper presentation towards the end so it will be primarily based on class participation and four problem sets so the problem sets will be about 2 to 3 weeks duration each we should soon have uh, next week the first problem set will hopefully be out and even though only the people crediting the course are required to actually submit the problem sets i would encourage all of you to actually do the problem sets and discuss with each other with me with ram with me and ram prasad because it's good to get your hands dirty these are top one topics unless you get your hands dirty you will not have a feel for the topic it's, you can listen and read but you have to actually work with the problem to get your feel of the stuff so i would recommend everybody to do the problem sets the problem sets will complement what is being done in class for example today's lecture itself there will be several pointers in which i'll say this will go into this homework this will go into that homework i do this quite often so the, doing the problem sets is a good accompaniment to the lectures so I recommend everybody even the, uh, those who are not crediting the course to actually do the problem sets whether you submit it or not is up to you but uh, do the uh, i would recommend strongly recommend that you do the problem set so that's i think that's all with respect to administration so let's get started let's this one let's get started the course so what is so let give you a quick introduction of what this course is going to be so basically the course we're going to ask if we have access to randomness so suppose we have access to randomness now i don't know what that means so for now let's assume randomness means somehow i can toss a coin a purely unbiased coin which comes up heads or tails with equal probability and i have access to the stream of points what does this help me when i if i have access to this can i do something with it is so if i have access to point is is it useful this is so we'll be asking several questions so suppose you have access to a random coin so in addition to our usual sort of actually this could be in whichever context it could be most of the course will be uh, related to the computational this is help in computation but you can ask this in whichever context i have access to a random coin a coin which comes up unbiased heads or tails and suppose we have access to this coin what can we do can we does this sort of increase our power can we do more things than what we could have done um, before and because the course is going to be sort of coming from a computer science perspective a lot of things almost most of the things i will say will be focused on what can i do more with respect to computation but we can ask these questions in other aspects and eventually actually we will see at various points of time during the course 
some of the definitions which we give here to understand what randomness means, what this one means, will actually be also we will be able to import or rather export these definitions to the other to other contexts. So is it useful? And the point purpose of this lecture, today's lecture is basically going to be show actually, I'm going to give a lot of examples in which randomness actually is very, very useful. The randomness is amazingly powerful. And we will see this in the context of algorithmic design. There will be several algorithms for which several problems for which once you have access to random points, you can design very nice algorithms for it. In fact, in some of the cases, you will be able to design better algorithms than what was known before. In some cases, you will be able to design algorithms in cases in which you don't know how to design algorithms. That is, I do not know a non-randomized algorithm, but with randomness, somehow we are able to design algorithms. So in algorithmic design, this happens to be a very useful tool, act, having access to this notion of randomness. Another place where we all of us use it regularly is the notion of in cryptography. So by now it's well known that randomness is quintessential for cryptography. If you don't have randomness, cryptography does not exist. This was discovered by Shannon a good 70 years ago. And since then, randomness is sort of the basis for cryptography. Anything in cryptography that we do requires randomness. And this will not be a focus of this course, but it's useful. Randomness is extremely useful for any time. Any time you type your credit card number, you do a bank transaction. All of those things are being encrypted, decrypted along the way, and all of these require randomness. If without randomness, these systems won't be, we won't be able to prove any uh, guarantee of security for any of these systems. So randomness is quintessential essential in cryptography, the way we do it. And then another place where randomness comes, this is more from a scientific or a mathematical perspective in combinatorial constructions. So randomness happens to be useful. So you want to show that a particular object exists, an object with a particular feature. We will see examples of this. I'm talking very abstractly right now. We want to show such an object exists. Most times, sometimes it might be obvious. We can construct this object by hand. We can actually show you this is the object. And here, see, that's why the object exists. Sometimes you won't be able to construct this object. And actually, it'll show that randomized things will actually help out to help to do these. Uh, the randomness will help to come up with these constructions. We'll see this uh, by the end of today's lecture already. And we'll see several examples of this over the course of the lecture. By the way, I should have mentioned, there's an accompanying crypto course that's being offered at TIFR, but that's one of the reasons otherwise I'm not going to be off saying anything on crypto related. It's offered by Akshay Ram and it's a very nice course. It's an introductory course in crypto and you're welcome to attend the course. So is it useful? So these will be some so randomness. We will see examples where randomness is actually very, very useful in real life. It's useful in algorithmic developments. It's useful in cryptography. It's useful in math in constructing these objects and stuff. Of course, now that it is useful, we know that we know if you give me a random coin and do it, you can ask, does such a random coin exist? Do, does randomness exist? Do we have access? So that's question one, which I'm going to ask. Question two, does randomness exist? Of course, if there are any quantum physicists in the audience, they'll say, yes, pure randomness does exist in nature and we can possibly use this. I don't know how to harness this. So we're going to ask other things. Is just random. We're going to ask this question. Suppose all of these are things I said we could do algorithm designs, cryptography, combinatorial constructions, all assuming that randomness exists as a theory was able to build. But now, come on, I need to, I'm going to use these. Can I, do I have them? We will ask, okay, uh, nature possibly provides randomness and possibly this randomness is not pure. You possibly don't have access to a, a, an unbiased coin. Possibly the coin is a biased coin. It possibly doesn't give you 50-50, but uh, somewhere between uh, it's uh, the, the probability of heads is somewhere between 40 and 60 and similarly probability of tails is 40 and 60. It possibly is sort of a, it's not a fully bi unbiased coin. There is some, a little bit of bias, but not too much bias. You could have that. It's a possibly an impure coin. And many of these algorithms will also require, not only do you have access to a coin, but you have access to a sequence of coins. We'll see some examples. It's not just one coin that you need, you'll need a sequence of coins. 
And basically what we'll need in probability, these are called as uncorrelated randomness. That is each coin should be uncorrelated to the other. The coins should be independent of each other. Possibly not true that nature's coins, the coins we get see in nature are independent. Possibly each event is related to prior events. So these are possibly not independent events. So impure coins, uh, correlated coins, how do we deal So coins don't come pure unbiased coins as what we expect them to be. The question is, how do we cope with this? And we'll see this also. Suppose ra pure randomness doesn't exist, but only impure randomness exists. Is that good enough for our applications? That is possibly randomness does not exist in its pure form. We design the algorithms, we design cryptography, we design these constructions by assuming that randomness exists in its sort of pristine form, but possibly such randomness doesn't exist in nature at all. If so, can do these algorithms break down? Does cryptography, all of network security break down just because uh, our assumption of what randomness was false? We'll still show that no, no, we can still sort of understand this. And this will lead us to understand what exactly is randomness. What does it mean random? So we will ask, do all of these things do we really need randomness in these algorithms or can we come to the, this, this will be the most of the focus for this course. Do we really need randomness? We try to answer this question. And for this, we'll have to answer, what does it mean to be random? And it will take us a while to understand, uh, come to define this object. We'll, I'll defer this to a few lectures from now. And in the course of this, we'll try to try to give a definition from the fields. We'll, we'll sort of give a utilitarian definition of randomness, not a randomness as what mathematicians or physicists would do as this pure source of randomness, a sequence of unbiased points which give you heads and tails. But what does randomness mean from the purpose of the user, from the purpose of the algorithmic designer, from the purpose of the from the point of view of the cryptographer? From their point of view, what do they need? from this random source. Can you provide that? That's all we care about. We are looking at applications. We ask for these response. At this perspective, will actually, it might seem a very, very computer science computation perspective, but actually it's going to be a very useful perspective. And it's turned out to be far more useful than we imagined it to be when it was, when this notion was actually conceived. So while doing this, we'll ask, can we eliminate randomness in some of these applications? Can we eliminate or reduce the amount of randomness in these applications. By the way, feel free to stop me and ask questions. Let's take it as an in-person class and stop me whenever one and ask questions. So we, these are the sort of questions we'll ask. Most of the focus, we, today's lecture will mostly be focused on item one in this list. We will show, I'll give you, I'll try to impress you how randomness is useful. Give you a, several examples and show how the power of randomness. But then later on, most of the course will actually focus on items two and three, where we we'll try to ask, what does it mean to be random? Can I, if this is all that I want of randomness, can I replace it with some other object? And this is why it's going to call pseudo-random. It's not random in the real sense of the word, but it is sort of, it looks random, it is pseudo-random. We'll come to this definition, a lecture or two, or possibly even like three lectures from now. But for now, we'll sort of see, understand the power of randomness. Any questions so far? I've been very, very general and abstract so far. And so I wanted to say one thing. Uh, typically, this course has a very complexity theory or algorithmic flavor uh, to it. Most of the students, at least currently taking the course, don't seem to be people from the complexity background. So I will, to the most possible, try to minimize the complexity needed for the course. That is, we'll try to keep the complexity applications as few as possible. And it will eventually, complexity will play a very big role. The sort of the growth of pseudo randomness and the growth of complexity as a subject mirrored each other uh, for from the 80s onwards, they have grown in parallel. So I can't sort of diverse the two. They will go together, but I will try to keep the complexity jargon as minimal as possible. So those, so if at times I say things which you do not follow, 
please do stop me and ask me if I talk of complexity classes and not. I'll try to talk in general in terms of just algorithm designs, crypto uh, uh, constructions, so it's sort of it's so that everybody is on the same pitch. But if there will be times when I do move to complexity, but please do stop and ask me questions then so that we get back to any questions. Sohan, did you have a question? No. Okay. Uh, did I indicate? I mean, I don't know. No, 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 no. You just, your thing turned from, for some reason, it just went. Uh, I don't know why. My oh, okay, went. okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Possibly you unmuted yourself. Okay. Okay. So, so that's going to be the up. Cool. What we will do today is we will try to, I will try to impress you with the power of randomness. So what we'll see is we'll see, I used a bunch of, we'll take various tasks, one problem after another. Being a computer science, most of these problems will be, have a heavy CS computer science flavor. And each of them, I'll show you some of them with proof. Some of them, I, I won't have time because I plan to do a good uh, five or six applications in the next uh, one hour or so. If I would have time to go with proof. I'll say them without proof. Some of them, some of them will actually go into the details and so the first application application one will be a problem in communication complexity. So suppose there are two parties, say Alice and Bob. There are two parties, Alice and Bob. So and Alice is given a string, say an n bit string. Bob is given an n bit string. They both of them get as inputs. Alice gets an n bit string as input, Bob gets an n bit string as input. And they need to sort of converse with each other. And at the end of it, find out if x is equal to y or not. Are these two n bits the same n bit string? So that's the task. This is what I'll call the equality, pro equality protocol. So is the goal clear? So Alice has an n bit string, Bob has an n bit string, and we think of n as something which is growing. So I want to now ask, the question which we want to ask is, hmm, how many bits? The question which we're going to ask is the following question. How many bits must Alice and Bob exchange to check if their inputs are equal? At the end of it, both of them should know the answer. They should both know that they are equal or they both should know that they are not equal. Hmm. So what's a solution for this? Let's start off with a very nice solution. How many bits should they exchange? N bits. Huh? N bits. So one of them sends across, one of them sends across the, their entire input to the other one. Then the other one locally checks uh, from their end if the two N bits are the same. And by the way, so n bits are not sufficient. Then the one, so suppose Alice does this, Bob will be able to check. At the end of it, Bob knows, but Alice doesn't know. So then Bob communicates to Alice back this fact whether the bits are the same, two inputs are not the same. So there's an n plus one bit protocol. So determinist, so if you so it's easy to see there's an n plus one bit. Determ when I mean, so I will use the word deterministic very often. That just means there is no randomness that the underlying object uses. So it's sort of jargon from the computer science this one. So it's just, so whenever I say deterministic, that means this particular protocol or this particular interaction 
Alice and Bob are not tossing any random points. There's an n plus one deterministic protocol. Hmm? And surprisingly, you can show that this is tight. You cannot do, you cannot even reduce one bit to this. You require n plus one bits. If, a, if you want a protocol such that for such that for every pair of uh, n bit strings, Alice and Bob can exchange things. And at the end of it, be convinced that they are equal or not equal. If you want to design a protocol, I haven't defined what this protocol means or not, but if you formally do do the definitions, what you can show is surprisingly tight. That is any deterministic protocol that computes equality requires n plus one bits in the worst case. That is, you can tell me, you can tell me you have a protocol you come up with some protocol that computes equality. I can always show, give you, you give me the protocol and I can then come up with two strings, X and Y, so that on this pair of strings, they will require N plus one bits. They cannot communicate any faster than this. Any, uh, uh, they can't do this thing any in any lesser number of bits of interaction. They have to exchange N plus one bits. And by the way, this will be on your first problem set. We'll show this fact will go into the first problem set that you actually will need n plus one. But so here is a case in which if you work with just deterministic protocol, you can't do anything. What we'll show is suppose now Alice and Bob had access to random coins. We will show that they can surprisingly do with much, much lesser bits of interaction. That's going to be our first. We will show that once you actually bring in randomness, suddenly the game changes. They don't have to exchange n plus one bits, we can do it much, much better. So allow random coins. Allow random coins. And now you can ask what does the allow random coins mean? For now, let's, for all these applications, I'm just going to assume you have pure unbiased coins. Alice can toss coins, Bob can toss coins. Uh, a sequence of independent coins, zero one coins that they have access to. Now you can have ask two questions. Does Alice have her own set of coins? Bob has his own set of coins. They say, let's even do more that they both have access to the same set of coins. That is, they are both watching TV, which is a sequence of random images out there. Of course, it's not uh, uncorrelated thing, but let's assume that they have access to. So let's make this assumption. That is, they both have access in the sky to a random string. They have access to a sequence of independent random points. And I want to know, show that surprisingly, once this is the case, I'm bringing in randomness. So R is a sequence of independent, for independent random points. Let's for now just assume R is also an n bit string, but it's equally likely to be any one of the two power n possibilities. Each of those one I want to say now, suppose they have this, and this has nothing to do with the inputs. The inputs are two facing. The R is completely a random, it's, it has no correlation with the inputs. I want to claim that now suddenly I'll give you a protocol in which Alice and Bob just exchange two bits and can be done away with the and you can do something. Of course, it's because it's going to be, I'm going to bring in randomness. Therefore, there's going to be some error in the thing. I'll come to all of that in a second. So what Alice is going to do is Alice is going to compute the dot product between X and R, that is summation Xi, Ri, mod 2. So Alice, let's compute this bit K and then sends A across to Bob. Bob computes a similar bit which for his input by R and Bob checks if A equals B. And then he sends this answer zero or one, if A equals B. That's going to be, the, it's a two bit protocol. Is the protocol clear? 
It's a two-bit protocol. But I want to say, actually, this protocol works. It's two bits, unlike n plus one bits. Notice n could be an arbitrarily long number. I want to say this protocol actually works. Then assuming that they have access to this public string. So let's look at the two cases. Let's look at the case when a e x equals y. In this case, certainly they are going to give the same answer because Alice's bit A that Alice computes and Bob's bit B that Bob computes are both going to be equal, always. If x is equal to y, this is always going to be equal. Therefore, the probability that the protocol is correct is actually one in this, no matter which random coins I toss. This is a probability space is over the choice of random coins. It's always correct in this case. Now let's look at what happens in the case x not equal to y. So what are we asking over here? We are asking what's the prob what's the, I want to ask what's the probability that the protocol is is wrong. So equivalently, this is the same as asking what's the probability of over r that x r equals y r. I'm just going to write this in a slightly different fashion. Write probability r x minus y r equals zero. All of this is happening mod two. So let's just call this probability r z r equals zero mod two, where z is equal to x minus y, and I'm doing it in gf two. Gf two. Uh, or gf uh, 2 and notice that this is the important point is this is not the all zero string because it's the difference between two things the only thing is you have a fixed string z now or z which is not the all zero string and you're going to take its dot product with a random n bit string i ask what's the probability that this is going to become equal to zero hmm. now let's do this so the, so because since z is not the all zero string, there exists some i in one to n such that z i is equal to one. It can't be the case. There's some bit in z which is not zero. Otherwise, so this probability star, I can rewrite it as probability over r z1 r1 plus z2 r2 all the way to z i r i z n r n equals zero. Just write it in a bit more confusion. I know z i is one. Therefore, this is just the probability that r i is equal to z one r one all the way up to z i minus one r i minus one plus z i plus one r i plus one all the way up to z and r. I'm just rewriting this one. Now notice this thing that is here is where I'm going to make use of the fact that the source of randomness I have is a sequence of unbiased independent random points. So let's think of the random coins as first you choose r1, r2, everything except ri. Now that turns out to be some value over here. Now I get to then choose ri. You're just asking is ri is equal to this value or ri is not equal to this value. ri will be equal to this value with exactly probability half. So this is probability half. Because the, the coins are independent of each other. Therefore, the probability that the algorithm is wrong is exactly half. Half the time it's going to give the right answer. Now you can just repeat this algorithm, repeat this protocol several times. Each time it's a constant time. So you can get the error down to how whichever small constant you want to and uh, uh, get away with this. So all that you needed was this access to shared random strings in the sky. If you could do it, suddenly you con compress the communication from n bits, from a linear number of bits to a constant number of bits. And this is an example where randomness actually is provably better off than deterministic. So having randomness really, really does help. This is 
fine therefore therefore with therefore the, the conclusion of this is there is a constant round a constant bit randomized protocol all of these need to be defined i am not going to do this for this lecture later on will be a bit more formal hmm? for equality in the shared random string model so here alice and bob are also able to maintain their secrecy yes i think they, they don't get to know what the other person has yeah this protocol has some other features in some they get to know but they do get to know the inner product dot product with this one bit yeah they do get to know i'm not talking about that right now they are two actually they let's assume they are not trying to hide anything from each other it's just that they are too mm -hmm. far away from each other and they want to check if their strings are equal they are cooperating they are they are not comp it's not a game between them it's they are cooperating and they want to reduce the cost of communication between them mm -hmm. this says that if they have access to this random string suddenly you can shrink the cost the communication cost from linear to constant mm -hmm. the randomness gives you this extra so this is a place where actually randomness is perfectly useful is provably useful and we'll come to this question that is how much randomness the way i designed the protocol we required n bits of randomness do we really require n bits do we have access to this all of these are questions which one should ask mm -hmm. so we should also treat randomness as a resource and ask do we need this can we do it with lesser bits of randomness do they actually need shared randomness what if there were in, not independent bits but correlated bits does the protocol still work we'll have to look at all this i'll we'll try to do that later but for now if they had access to this magical source of randomness this tells you that you can reduce the communication all the way from linear to constant mm -hmm. questions so that's one application where randomness is actually extremely provably helpful okay the next application will be from ramsey theory so one of the famous results in ramsey theory proved by erdos and sekeris They show that you give me any graph with n nodes in it, hmm? either it will have a clique. A clique is a bunch of vertices so that every two. So in a graph, there's two objects called the clique and the independent set. A clique is a set of vertices so that there's an edge between every pair of vertices. An independent set is a set of vertices so there's no edge between any pair of this. It's just the complements of each other. What uh, there are more, one of the famous results of Ramsey theory says that every n vertex simple graph what i mean by simple is no multi edges and no loops graph has either a clique of size half log n or an independent set of size half log so it has to have one of these two or equivalently this is said that is either alpha which is usually what's called the is called the independent set is it the independent set number or is it the alpha is okay. yeah alpha is independent set yeah alpha is independent set number so either alpha of g is greater than half log n 
or alpha of g complement is greater than half root. That's a sort of a succinct way of writing this one. This is sort of one of the early theorems that sort of set off the foundation of Ramsey. Hey, it was Zekeris theorem. I'm sorry, can you repeat what alpha is? Alpha is just the size of the largest independent set. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So alpha G complement is the size of the clique in the graph because we're talking about the complement of the graph. That no, it's exactly the wordings I've written before, it's just a short form of writing the uh, long thing. So now once you have this, you can now construct, you can ask, okay, how yeah, put half log in. Can I increase this half log in? Can I show larger? Or if I cannot, can I come up with a graph which neither has a large clique or an independent set? Can I come up with an example of a graph which in which both the largest clique and the largest independent set are not too large from each other? That is, can the Erdos Sekiris theorem be improved further? Can I show this? We want to ask this question. Can I, what's the, can I come up with an example of a graph? So, so what we're going to ask, the question we're going to ask is how tight is this? Is the above? So can I come up with, and how do I show this is tight? If I can come up with a graph in which both the largest clique and the largest independent set are fairly small. Ideally, it would be if I show them to be half log in, then it shows that this thing is tight. Hmm? And how did Erdos, so Erdos actually answered this question and Erdos proved the following amazing theorem. He showed there is an n vertex graph, once again, simple graph. such that alpha g, so simple graph g, so that alpha g is less than or equal to two log n. And so its independent set is not too large and its clique is also not too large. And how did Erdos prove this theorem? So you can ask, how did you come up? Did he come up? Did he construct this graph? He actually used randomness to prove this theorem. What he showed was if you pick a random graph on n vertices, hmm? so what he picked was what the proof was some by what is called the probabilistic method. Here is where randomness is not used in an algorithmic sense, but is used in sort of a, to show a certain, some object exists. What the error showed was, if you pick a random graph G, G is a graph, is a random graph on N vertices. So basically what is it, what does it mean? It's a string, it's a random string of length. So in equivalently, this is a random string of length N choose two, because you have to, for every edge, there are N choose two possible edges. For every edge, you have to decide whether so, so random graph, I can just view it as picking a, a random string, a uniformly random string of length n choose two. For every edge, you decide whether to have the edge in or not have the edge in. And he showed that this probability or alpha g complement is less than two log n. This is greater than zero. And because it uh, is greater than Pranad, zero, you want an and, right? Sorry, and. and because it's greater than zero, there exists one such graph. If it were zero, because it's greater than zero, there exists one such graph. Actually, he showed a fair number of graphs. This is so he was not able to actually construct a graph. He used randomness in the proof of this to show that such a graph exists. And since then, it's been an open problem to actually come up with an explicit construction of such a graph. So it is open, it's now more than 80 years to actually come up 
with an alternate explicit. And just like deterministic, this is another word I will use quite often in this course. Explicit will mean non-randomized. Don't use random points. Can you actually come up with a graph? Can I come up with an algorithm that produces a graph? So in this lecture, I'll be vague about it. Later lectures, when I use the word explicit, I'll be more formal about it. Can come up with a, an explicit construction, an alternate explicit construction of such a graph. And this has been open. This has been open. Very recently, a result of Chattopadhyay, Zuckerman, and Cohen comes close to this. It doesn't get this. It's it's sort of quasi-polynomially far away from, or quasi-exponentially, depending how we look at it, far away from this. And this will actually be, it'll, we will depending on how much time, we'll actually give this alternate construction due to Chattopadhyay as a terminus. It will be related to what we'll call extractors, which is a big topic, one of the topics of our discussion later on in the course. So recently, Chattopadhyay. So come on. Open. Give, I think, exponential in log log n to the power c or some c greater than. Okay. And we will do this most likely. So, this is a place in which actually this is a, the first example was a place where randomness is probably useful. With deterministic, I could. You needed linear number of bits. With randomness, you could get it down all the way to constant. There's another case in which you wanted to show a particular object exists. Hmm. And the way we knew how to do it is we just pick a random object and show that it has this property. And we'll see a flavor of this several times over in this course. We'll see this. And then we'll ask, is there an alternate way of coming up with this object explicitly without randomness? And for some of these problems, actually, this is a still wide open problem. We don't know how to get rid of it randomness in its process. Any questions? This that will be our application. Two, we'll move on to third application, just primality. I'm just going to give you the whole cast was going to be a series of examples in which randomness has played a great role in actually in all of these cases. We don't know how to do it without randomness. Rather, the first algorithms we had, the first objects we had were all to do with randomness. These are all the various examples in which randomness has had a very powerful way in coming up with these objects. So first was equality. Now is the Ramsey theory come up with a graph with both a large independent set as well as so the small independent set and a small clique. Any questions? Not we'll move to the next. So next, this one is going to be the problem which most probably might. will be problem which many of you are familiar with. Certainly, you've heard about, but I will. Certainly, I cannot not mention it in a in the introductory lecture to pseudo randomness. Is the problem of given a number, I want to check if it's prime or not. So, given and a positive integer, n, and in binary. So, n is represented using log n bits. Hmm? check n is prime or composite.
this is possibly one of the most storied problems in computer science has probably been around since ever since we started talking about numbers and stuff and so you given a number you want to check if it is prime or not and we man has discovered several ways to do this but not till very recently and recently is still about uh, till about 50 years ago or I mean 60 years ago did we actually have an efficient way of doing this we wanted to given a number we want to check if it is prime or not so there's a long history to it and finally it came up with miller and miller showed that it started off with the work of i'm going to give just give a brief history miller showed that if the extended riemann hypothesis were true then there's a polynomial there's a deterministic polynomial algorithm for primality somehow show that if the extended riemann hypothesis are in fact true then you could come up with a deterministic polynomial time algorithm then robin joined miller and miller and robin showed that this algorithm it was a it was a determ it was a deterministic algorithm it was an algorithm that did not toss any coins robin showed that if you allow but notice it's even though it didn't toss any coins it's a conditional algorithm it depends on the it's true only if the extended riemann hypothesis were true if the riemann hypothesis were false god forbid if that were the case uh, we don't know what the status of this algorithm is it could be a correct algorithm it could be a false the algorithm's correctness depended on the uh, erh being true what robin then said is you, so this was sort of unsatisfactory because a good algorithm is unsatisfactory for this so robin when robin joined miller and then the so modified miller algorithm said if now you give the algorithm some extra power you give it the power to ra toss random coins we'll formalize this what it means it just says the algorithm has another input in addition to its usual input which is n it also gets input every now and then it can press a button and get a purely random coin an unbiased random coin suppose the algorithm had access to this then suddenly this algorithm you can remove the dependence on erh and you can come up with a randomized algorithm they showed that there is a randomized algorithm randomized the important thing is a polynomial time algorithm notice if you are allowed to run an exponential time if you are allowed to run time running in n you can certainly do it because you can go over all the factors all the numbers less than n but because you are running poly time you are running time poly in the length of the input which is poly log n that's what makes this problem hard so there's a randomized polynomial time to check if n is plus anyway that's what i'm doing and what do i mean by randomized polynomial time they showed the following that is if n is prime if this is prime on algorithm let me call it mr miller robin so the random algorithm tosses some random points it's going to so the mr algorithm takes as input n and the randomness this one and then it's going to output either prime or composite it will output and then it takes two inputs one is n one is r and then it's going to output sort of thing it had the feature that in this case just like in the equality case if they were equal it's going to output one all the time if n is composite then probability over r mr nr outputs prime this was less than say 110 so it's going to err with a very small probability when the numbers were composite these will be what we will eventually call one sided randomized uh, algorithms or what are called coarp so that's a term which we don't need to know what they actually came up with was an algorithm this way it's an algorithm it's a randomized algorithm so it tosses points it doesn't give the right answer always so it's going to make some error but the er error probability you can control it particular in, if the number were prime they said the numbers the algorithm will always tell you it's prime if the number is composite most of the time and most is not over n the most is over r so most rs it will actually give you the right answer 9/10 of the time will give you the right answer this 9/10 can be made 
as large as possible. It can be in any large constant. So it can be say uh, one by hundredth or this. So this is what they showed. And around the same time as Miller, Rabin, Solovey, and Strassen also gave a similar randomized algorithm, not using these ideas, but a different ideas. Both are number theoretic algorithms, randomized algorithm, randomized polytime algorithm. And this was the sort of state of art. In fact, for all practical purposes, even today, when our computers run primality algorithm, and I want to give on a number, I want to check if it's not there, actually do run the miller rabin algorithm. The miller rabin algorithm is extremely efficient. It's very, very fast. And that's the sort of algorithm that's used in practice. It's a randomized algorithm. This was one of the earliest. It's not the first randomized algorithm, but it's one of the earliest known randomized algorithms, which is still proven to be useful. That is, has been useful. But more recently, several of you know, in 2003, 2000, so the question came, do I need randomness 2002? Yeah. Maybe the journal paper was in 2003 or something. People ask, is randomness essential for primality? To check if this one, it's a question you ask. It's the same question which we asked before in an abstraction. You can ask it for this particular problem. Do you need randomness? In fact, it's a question that has plagued ever since Miller Raven and Solovey Strasser. People kept on asking this question. Is there a way in which you can eliminate randomness in the these algorithms? And there were several algorithms with it. And eventually, Agarwal, Kayal, and Saxena in a land in a breakthrough algorithm gave a deterministic. Poly time algorithm for primality. And it's not an algorithm that came out of the hat. They actually took a randomized algorithm, not exactly the Miller Rabin or Solovey Strasser, some other randomized algorithm, and de randomized it, removed the randomness in it, along exactly the sort of principles which we'll be building later on in the course. It was actually one of the in prime examples of pseudo randomness to get rid of randomness to understand what is the randomness you need. And this is sort of one of the big successes of the field of pseudo randomness was the result of Agarwal Kayal. And so I'm not sure we'll have time to do any of these, the Miller Rabin, Solovey Strassel, Agarwal Kayal, Saxena, they're all beautiful algorithms. Some of you might have seen this in the algorithms course. If you have done any algorithms courses, have done. I don't know if we'll have it. If your people are interested, one of you can present the Agarwal Kayal Saxena after we do build the necessary theory for this. We won't have time, but it's an example of a, one of the successes of the area of pseudo randomness. That is, we understood what is the randomness needed for this algorithm and we're able to eliminate it. What exactly is the notion of randomness? And we're able to replace it completely deterministic. And now we have a deterministic polynomial time algorithm for primality. Any questions? Uh, does the uh, if the probability of error is small, does it mean the length of R is sort of proportionately increasing? So you, yeah. So if so, so suppose you were the probability of error is one by hundred. They say length of R is say the same length as the input. It's also log n bits. Okay. Now to get the now thing to be, uh, you want to just uh, the, for an RP error application. We'll see this later on. If you want to reduce the say from one by hundred, you want to make the uh, thing. You just run it twice. So it's from log n, you get, suppose the original, let's not call it log n, let's just say the original number of random bits was m. Now, if you run it, say, k times, now you will require km bits of randomness because each, each run requires m bits of randomness. You will reduce the error from 1 by 100 to 1 by 100 to the power k. Okay. So notice the error is for dropping down exponentially in k, whereas the length of the string is only increasing linearly in k. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you, you, you should, if the length is linear in the polynomial in the input size and we get some constant, we don't, I will not say anything more. We'll talk about this in detail when I come to a bit of, we'll spend half a lecture on complexity classes and error reduction of them and all. But what you, your question is valid is, say, say, say this particular algorithm used M, which is say 
10 log n random points. So it's, it's polynomial in the input length. The input was log n, it used 10 times more. And with that, you were able to get the error to 1 over 100. Now I want to get the error down to 1 over 100 square. You just repeat the algorithm twice. So instead of 10 log n, you're going to use 20 log n, and the error will come down to 1 by 100 square. In particular, if you repeat it k times for these type of one-sided error, that is error, things that error only on one side, you will be able to, if you repeat it k times, you will get, the, if the original error was epsilon, you will be able to make the error epsilon to the k. So the error dramatically, in fact, in very little time, in hardly any time, so you can, for example, k can itself be made polynomial. So you can make epsilon to the power k as small as, um, a small, a small uh, one, 1 over epsilon k can be, uh, epsilon can be made so small that as a 1 over epsilon is larger than the atoms of the universe. So the success probability is so overwhelmingly good. And all of this can be done in poly time. So even though it's a randomized algorithm, it's almost, it will never ever make, it's hardly ever, the chances of it make you do it, failing is very, very rare. Okay. Yeah, I will we'll define what these randomized algorithms are and all later on. Notice the important point is this randomness is over the choice of R. It's not over the choice of N. It's not like certain inputs, it will get the wrong answer. For every input, it gives you the right answer. And the error probability is only the choice of which random points it causes. There might be some coins that cause the algorithm to fail. But for every input, it gives you the right answer. Okay. The answer your question, Shushan? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. So let's move on to that. So this is sort of one of the prime examples of the successes of pseudo randomness. We'll see how much we can cover this in the course. We, but I believe people who have taken algorithms course will have seen one of Solovey Strassen or Miller Rabin and possibly even the Agarwal Kayal Saxena uh, algorithm. Okay. If not, we will cover it. I'll, we'll check with when we cover the details, we'll see it later on in the course. But let's move on to our next application. application. Four. It's generating points. So we do know that the primes are infinite, but we've known for a very, very long time that the primes are infinite. So they occur infinitely often. Uh, 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 this one. They, of course, their gaps become larger and larger. But then we have the prime number theorem, which says that if you take any set of n, if you take the first n numbers, you expect on average, you expect to see about log n primes in this. So even though the n over log n primes, sorry, n over log, uh, the pro you would see the probability you'll see a prime is uh, n over log n. The number of primes you see is no, the so, probability of prime is one over log n. I'm mixing up everything. The pro the num the number of primes you will see among n, n of them, n over log n of them will be primes. Therefore, the probability if you pick a random number that it will be a prime number is like one over log n. So this tells you. So suppose you add this question. So, so now why question? So let's I'm going to turn this into a problem. So I give you a num give given a positive integer n once again in binary hmm? output a prime number between n and 2n. We do know there always exists a prime between n and 2n for any n. Now, question is output one of such, right? To this day, we don't know how to come up with a deterministically such an algorithm. But the prime number theorem, which I just now said, will say that just pick randomly numbers between n and 2n and check if they are prime. We know how to check if they are prime. Either use the randomized algorithm, which I told before, or the deterministic algorithm. You can check if it's prime and with probability one over log n, one of them will be a prime number. So you do this, you do this log n times, certainly you will lay your hands with very high probability on a prime number. 
So this, in fact, we need primes in all our cryptographic applications. Typical most cryptographic applications take two large primes, multiply them, and come with a composite number. That's the start of the basis for the secure system, the crypto system that's being studied. Question is, how do you lay your hands on this? So you want an algorithm that efficiently generates primes. What's an algorithm? One you can ask, come up with an algorithm. To this day, we don't know how to do uh, this efficiently. The only way we know how to do it is pick, uh, pick numbers, pick random numbers. between n and 2n, it were random number say m, probability that m is prime is roughly one over log n. Therefore, you do this process, you do this process log n times or 10 log n times, invariably you will land up, at least one of them will be a success and you will be sure. Now you can ask the question, can I come up with a deterministic? Given that this is such an important problem to generate a prime, can you actually come up with a deterministic way of doing it? And this is actually um, a, a problem that is still open. We don't know how to do this. So it's, op it's open to come up with a deterministic. By this, I mean without randomness a procedure. to generate large primes. So that's open. Uh, so I have one question. Sure. Can, is it possible that we can also generate the factor of the prime? We can the generate time? the factor. So you uh, want, no, no, no. The prime doesn't have factors. You want to say, I want to generate. Uh, uh, you want to generate a composite and its factors. Right. Yeah. Right. Composite. So, given a composite, given a composite number to factorize it, this is hard. We believe it's very, very hard. This is factorization. We believe it's a very hard problem. But if you want to pick a random number along with its factorization, this surprisingly turns out to be easy. And this will be a problem set somewhere along the line in your problem set. Yeah. And give a problem set which actually pick a random number such. Uh, such that it comes up with the number and its factorization. This actually happens. We know how to do this. We'll see this. This is open. What we do know today, this is actually very recent. We do know that we don't have deterministic things, but we have something called almost deterministic, which we call, which I'll call pseudo-deterministic. And we'll define this. Uh, Abhishek seems to have a question. Uh, Abhishek, do you want to go ahead? Hmm. Yeah, so I don't know the relevant theorems here. So I know that there is a prime between n and 2n. I don't know why there is, but there is. Yeah. Uh, uh, but when you write this statement that probability m is a prime when you choose a random m between n and 2n is, you know, approximately 1 upon log n. Mm -hmm. So doesn't, can, I mean, can it be very bad with N sometimes? I mean, okay. Most of the times or for large enough N, I can understand that this, this better be true because of prime number theorem, mm -hmm. but uh, there could be, I mean, I don't know how large the N needs to be. And so, so this could depend on N, right? This oh, so the prime number theorem, uh, prime number theorem possibly say this asymptotic sets in from say one N naught after that you have this feature. Hmm. After that, this yeah. theorem is true. So prior to that, I'm going to sort of cheat and say, if you give me a, give me a ranges between them, I'll just brute force go and pick one. I have a table. That's a constant time. So it's sort of like a cheat, but right now that will answer your question because that doesn't depend on the input length. It's a fixed and not, and it sort of answers the question. So all of the problems which we talk about will be, you'll only be interested when N is very large. But if it's if something is not true for constant, small N, constant N, those, all those you can just hardwire or brute force, at least for the application. This might not be a very satisfactory answer, but we can. And of course, then you'll ask him, what is this constant again? Is it, is it like a, is it a reasonable constant? Is it like 100, 200,000? Or is it like the atoms of the universe, the age of the universe or which one? Of course, that will matter. Both of them are polynomial time algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> but 
that we'll come to that later on yeah i think this was a re- this is no no this is done in practice this is how primes are produced in practice every single time a uh, key is being generated it picks up two large primes multiplies it to get a composite number that's the key and it does exactly this algorithm it just picks a number and check if it's prime so this is a very efficient algorithm okay i do not know it possibly needs more theorems in number theory to prove how fast and why it works but this is the algorithm it just picks a number uh, randomly from between n and 2n and checks if it's prime okay thank you so Prala, just question. to clarify one uh, minor thing so this is using a prime number theorem in a sort of strong form right it's not just saying that there are at least n over log n primes but the number of primes between 1 and n is more or less equal to n over log n. Yeah, that is it's yeah. not much larger not much smaller yes. that's why you are now able to conclude that between n and 2n also you should have a considerable number of those also being prime yes yeah okay yeah yeah okay that's problems related to prime so next application sorry uh, i i i think you were just mentioning what pseudo deterministic so, algorithm so, 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 de- so we don't yet have how to do this without randomness this is a randomized procedure so it's open how to do it deterministically an algorithm which does not toss random points what we do know today is an algorithm that is just like pseudo random as pseudo deterministic i it will take us while to define what it is it will be well into the second half of the course we do have pseudo deterministic algorithms that output primes and that actually comes exactly from the theory of pseudo randomness that we will be building and we will actually see this as one of the applications of our theory it will have nothing to do with primes the whole theory but eventually you will apply this and show there is a pseudo deterministic an algorithm that is going to output primes deterministically not fully sense uh, we will try in what sense it's a pseudo deterministic we'll come to that but we do have such algorithms and it's open how to make the pseudo deterministic into a fully deterministic we don't yet know how to do it but we believe there is one okay. i don't think you need any stronger form of the asymptotic uh, for this because if you just assume that the number of, the fraction of primes is 1 upon log n uh, or rather i should say pi x upon x is approaching 1 upon log x as x goes to infinity so that that should be enough for for this because no but i mean i guess the thing is i mean like bit no, now if you shouldn't you don't i mean you don't want a situation where all the primes between 1 and 2 n are actually between 1 and n right but that so can't happen be... once you once you assume this asymptotic then that yeah, yeah so that's right. what i mean what i meant is that the asymptotic is not just a lower bound but it's an upper bound also that is you are assuming that between 1 and n you don't have substantially larger than n over log n primes also but if you have that asymptotic then you know that you cannot have substantially larger than those n primes because after after large enough n the fraction has to be close to 1 upon log n uh-huh. no 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 i i mean like in the sense that sometimes people just use the prime number theorem to sort of say that the primes between 1 and n is at least n over log n at least oh, I see. but that's okay. that won't be sufficient for what was written above that's what i wanted to say because if, right. if all you have is a lower let's take bound this, i have yeah let's take this off man okay, i sorry, uh, okay. finish a couple of things yeah let's take this off man because i want to do two more applications at least for the set up the for next picture uh, another places where randomness has turned out to be really useful and the problem here this is a problem which we won't do today but we'll discuss in full details over the course of this course that is given an undirected simple graph g say v and e and two special vertices which we call source and target in v question is does there exist a path or are s and t connected and this is the problem i want to solve question is
that's the question which I care for. And if you have done any basic algorithmic course, uh, course in algorithms, you would have seen this. There are very basic algorithms called depth first search, breadth first search, which basically solve this problem for you. They're given two vertices and uh, then undirected graphs. In fact, they do it even for directed graphs. Huh? But the undirected will come important to us shortly. They will find out if there's a path between these both. But these algorithms, these depth first search, breadth first search, happen to be expensive in terms of space. If you actually implement this algorithm, you will notice that all these algorithms involve a stack or something out there, which will, and the stack size could be as large as the size of the graph. That is, they are nearly linear in the size of the graph. So what we would want to ask the question now is, can you do this efficiently in space? I'm being very vague here, and I will be vague. We'll, we will actually discuss this problem in detail later on in this course, but I'm right now I'm just going to be vague. I want an algorithm which does not store too much of the graph. That is memory wise, it doesn't store too much of the memory. There's the original graph written down you have, and then you want to now find out if two, two vertices are connected. You must not use in use considerably more extra uh, paper to solve this problem. So think of it as a graph has been written down on a piece of paper to you. And you know, the graph is huge. It's, it's a graph on n vertices. Think of n as a very large number. It's a million, trillion, whatever. And now you have some amount of paper in your hand and you want to now figure out if two vertices are connected or not. Now the standard algorithms like depth first search, breadth first search will work, but they their implementation involves a stack. And this the size of the stack is typically linear in the size of the graph. Therefore, the amount of extra paper that you will need to solve the problem will be linear, will be the size of the graph itself. What I want to ask is, can you do this with significantly smaller this one? How small is small? Can I ask a constant size paper? No, that's unfair to ask because you need to at least address every vertex. You need at least to show I'm at the 10th vertex, I'm at the 15th vertex, I'm at the nth vertex. An address takes login. Therefore, to even write the address Let's expect you put in log n space. So I give you paper size, which is order log n in the size of the graph. Now with this amount of paper, can you solve the problem? Can you find out if the two vertices are connected or not? And surprisingly, what is true is the most naive randomized algorithm works. That is just walk randomly in the graph at every vertex, walk like a drunkard at every intersection, just decide randomly to pick so basically I'm asking, I'm at, I'm at a bar. I want to go back to my hotel. How do I go back to the hotel? So say that if, if it were an undirected graph, you just, at every intersection, you just pick a random path or route to take and you will reach your hotel. Actually the algorithm which we show will prove not only do you reach your hotel, you'll actually reach every hotel in the city along this way. This is an algorithm and you'll do this in polynomial time. The algorithm is both polynomial time and the space required for this algorithm is extremely efficient. What you need at each point of time, you just need to be able to toss a coin and figure out which so you just need to store the current address of where you are in the graph. And that's just log n. So there is an, so there was an extremely efficient, there is an efficient with respect to space. randomized algorithm for let's call this uh, for let's call this Yukon undirected connectivity for Yukon and this algorithm has been there since the 70s it's what's called the and we will see this once we talk about eigenvalues and you know, stuff later on in the class this will be an easy application of that to show that the randomized walk, the random walk on a graph will actually, on an undirected graph, will check if any two vertices are connected or not. And it was a big open question as whether this can be de-randomized. Can you eliminate randomness from this? By the way, for this part, it was important. This theorem is only true if the graph is undirected. It's not true if the graph is directed. If the graph is directed, it's not true that a random walk will, in poly time, be able to uh, check if two vertices are connected or not. It, uh, we don't, that's not necessarily true. And we will see as part of this course in 2000, this have I got the number, right? Is it 2004? I believe it was 2004. So 2004, Reingold 
gave a deterministic log space. And log space is what I mean efficient in space. Algorithm. for Yukon. And once again, this algorithm was developed precisely because of the things that were developed as part of pseudo randomness. It's actually a classic demonstration of the power of pseudo randomness. And we will see both the efficient randomized algorithm as well as the corresponding Reingold's algorithm, the de randomization of the randomized algorithm in the book, in the over the, in the lectures. Later on, we will see both of these. This is another, just like primality was an example, it was the, the first known algorithm was a randomized algorithm, and then eventually we removed the randomness from it and came with a deterministic algorithm. This is also another classic case in which it was one of the earliest algorithms. It also was discovered in the 70s. Randomized algorithms was discovered in the 70s. He came up with a randomized log space algorithm for undirected connectivity, and eventually we were able to then determinist, determinize this algorithm. So in both these things, what is, how does randomness actually help you? In both these cases, these are cases in which actually the original algorithm were actually randomized algorithms. And later on, we used the theory of pseudo randomness to get rid of randomness. We understood what exactly was the randomness needed for these algorithms and sort of this one. This doesn't say that randomness is useless. It sort of says like when you start learning a cycle, you have this sort of this aided wheel sometimes which help you to do it so it's faster to learn it it's an easier algorithm to come up with and sometimes it's actually a better algorithm so these randomized algorithms both in the cases of primality and undirected connectivity are possibly faster than their corresponding more recent deterministic counterparts but they are easier to come they are more natural algorithms to uh, randomness as a tool is a very very powerful tool it lets you on first realize that the existence of such algorithms and then there's this theory of pseudo randomness which we will see which helps show you that this is all the this is all that you want of this randomness. This is all that you need of this notion of an aided uh, wheels for this bi bicycle. And then we know how to get rid of them and still have these algorithms run in practice. That's what happened in both these cases in the primality setting and in undirected connectivity. We came the original algorithms, the natural algorithms were the randomized algorithms, and eventually we de-randomized using the theory of pseudo randomness. And we will see this as part of the course. Any questions so far? Okay. I want to do two more applications. I won't have time. So I'll just do one, the easier one, and then defer actually my favorite randomized algorithm to the next lecture. But let's do one the one more this one. So application. Six. Actually, should I do this at all? Let, let's let me do this. I'll do this next time to max cut. I'll recall the whole thing next time. So once again, uh, let let's before I tell you what the problem is, let's tell you what the thing is. You're given a there's a graph G. It's a simple graph again. And suppose S and P are two subsets of vertices, sub, two subsets of the vertices, not necessarily disjoint or so. We can talk about what is called the cut between S and T, which is exactly the edges with one endpoint in S and another endpoint in T. That's what we call the cut edges, is the cut across S and T. So this is the graph G, that's S, that's P. The cut edges refers to these cut between S and T. And if I just say cut of S, this is referring going to refer to cut between S and its complement. Particularly, if that's the graph, the cut edges refer to the edges going out. And the problem that we will ask here is the following given C 
simple graph g v e find cut s it maximizes the size of the cut that's the problem looking at We want to find the line of the cut. Unlike all the previous examples we've seen of, this is a problem which is actually we know it's NP complete. So randomness or no randomness, there's no way in which I can come up with one, no way in which I can expect to come up with an algorithm that solves this problem. This is actually this is a problem known to be NP hard. It's in the COPS list of origin COPS list of. NP complete problems. So I don't expect whether using randomness or without randomness, deterministic or non randomized, to come up with an algorithm that will solve this problem. So, given that it is so hard, what we can ask is can I relax my thing? Can I come up with a not necessarily the largest cut? Can I come up with a cut which is, say, 99% of the largest cut? It's guaranteed to give me. At a pretty good cut. So I want an approximation to the largest approximation to max cut. Can I come up with something which is one? And what we'll show is once you're allowed random points, actually there's a very easy half approximation. I can always come up with a half approximation to the max cut. There are better than half. You might have seen this in algorithmic courses, algorithm courses. But I'll show you half as a demonstration of the power of randomness. And the algorithm is actually, so I'm going to give you a half approximation algorithm. Half approximation max cut. The algorithm is actually input is a graph G, V E. It's going to take me longer time to run the write the steps than the actual algorithm. It's just output a random subset of vertices. Just pick. There are how many sets of vertices? There are there are two par n sets of vertices. Just pick one of them at random. Basically, how do I do this? For every vertex, toss a coin, an independent toss coin. Decide whether to keep it in the yes or keep it outside yes. Just toss n coins. Based on these n coins, determine which is the set yes and output that set. So you're using random coins essentially. So do this. You completely ignore the graph. All I know about the graph is, all I'm using about the graph is as an n vertex graph. That's all because I need to toss n coins. The number of coins I toss is based on the graph. Other than that, I don't even look at the structure of the graph. And I want to say this actually outputs a pretty good cut. Why? Let's look at the expected value of the cut output by this. What is this? The randomness is over the choice of S. That's the random space. What is this once again? It's expected S. Let's go, what is the size of the cut? The size of the cut, we can equally write it as set of all edges. It's the indicator random variable that E is cut by S and V minus S. So I pick a random cut. I'm asking, is this edge? I go edge after edge and I ask if this edge is cut by it. And it's a sum of this across all the edges. Okay. Linearity of expectation will tell you that you can bring out the this one. By the way, this I'm giving it as an example. We'll be using these things again. Uh, linearity of expectation tells you this. So you can go as expected value of S of just this indicator random variable of whether E is cut. So let's, let's write it this way. E belongs to cut S, V minus S. This is just summation. It's an indicator random variable. So this is exactly the probability if I pick a random S that E is cut. And what is this? 
So if I have to cut it, I have to pick one endpoint and not pick the other endpoint. And it could be either way. So the only two things that matter whether this edge is cut or not are the two endpoints that matter. So it only it doesn't care. You don't care how the other endpoints determine. These two endpoints matter. If you if you decided to pick both of them, then it's not cut. If you decided to drop both of them, it's not cut. It's cut exactly if you pick one of them and don't pick the other. And there are four possibilities. All of them are likely. In half the cases, it's going to get cut. The other half the cases, it's not going to get cut. So this is exactly equal to some, sorry, this is not E and E, this is E and E. So this is half, so you get size of E by two. What's the maximum number of edges that can be cut? It's just all set of all edges. And I'm giving you a half approximation using randomness. So I can give you at least as good as half the number of cuts. And randomness gives you this. Let's end it. So we're going to get a half approximation using so each of these are examples of algorithms where actually algorithms are instances where having randomness, having this access to independent random coins actually gives you a lot of power. It helps you do things which we did not know how to do before. In some cases, okay, we did not know how to do before. In the case like primality, undirected connectivity, we were not able to do before, but later on we were able to eliminate randomness. But it was the fact that we had access to this randomness gave us the initial algorithms to these cases. It actually gave us, randomness was a very, very useful tool. And these are the six examples. I wanted to do one more example, which I will defer to next lecture. And what we will do next lecture is we'll take one of these algorithms, ask what, how much of randomness do it really need? Does it need fully randomness? Can I de-randomize it? Can I eliminate the notion of randomness in these algorithms? And we'll work that way. And that will then go on to actually developing theory of pseudo-randomness. I'll stop with this. I'm already seven minutes past time. Any questions? Uh, is there a clear separation between pseudo-deterministic and pseudo-random? I haven't defined what pseudo-deterministic at all is. No, there are two very different concepts. There are two very different things. We will, I have defined neither of them. Certainly you should, hopefully in two lectures, we will define what pseudo-randomness is. Pseudo-deterministic will take a while. Okay. Yeah. So in this max cut thing, can we say something about the uh, concentration of this expectation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, right now this algorithm is not this, it's not concentrated. So you can ask this. It's a randomized algorithm. It's not concentrated. So I want to know how well this is. But actually, later on, very beginning of this, this will be the first thing we'll do in the next lecture. We'll eliminate the randomness completely. So it doesn't matter whether it's concentrated or not concentrated. I'll give you a deterministic algorithm. No. Exactly this feature. Yeah. Yeah. We will also talk about concentration of this that will come. We'll see that pairwise independence is sufficient to look at this, and that will give you some concentration. So we will, uh, either the next lecture or the follow-up lecture, we'll see some basic probability inequalities like Markov, Chebyshev, and Chernoff, and see how those can be applied to these algorithms. Okay. Any other questions? So this class was just to tell you randomness is great. And the rest of the course will tell you we can throw, get rid of randomness. That's how. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'll just.